So it's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight with you guys to talk a little bit about what's going on now and what's happening in the future. But to really think about the future, you have to think about what innovation means, what technology means for us as a society, as a humanity. We have to reflect on what progress looks like. And when you think about it, as a species, we started innovating from the moment we were us, right? We, we started to develop tools, and with those tools, we developed fire, right? And if you think about the tenets of innovation, it's things that help us uh, to help in the convenience of our lives. It's to help us do more. It's to help us be able to expand beyond the limitations of our human anatomy, right? So fire let us cook food and use it more efficiently and provided warmth in our lives. You know, if you think about the wheel, we were able to carry heavier loads than we would. Uh, we were able to go farther distances by exerting less energy than what we're an an sorry, uh, anatomically capable of doing, right? Electricity then came in. We can light, we can have light so we can read, we can have light so we can work and be more productive for longer hours. And then, when you look at this timeline, it's hundreds of thousands of years ago we, we cultivated fire, right? And then the wheel, similar kind of time frame. And then electricity is in the hundreds, right? It's uh, 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 not very long ago. And if you think about the computer, which allowed us to capture knowledge and then access that knowledge uh, uh, at our own will uh, and do more, that was very recent, relatively speaking, to when we discovered fire. And then the phone. We have data centers worth of computing, mainframes worth of computing, multiple times over in a little device that carries energy with itself in our pocket. And so innovation happens faster and faster, and it's enhancing our ability to do more in the world and do more with uh, 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 ourselves. And so we, we envision, well, what does the next key major innovation look like, right? Uh, and, you know, this is a scene from a movie. Uh, it's called Her, right? And, you know, we often uh, romanticize the future and then realize it. We have this tendency to realize the future as we imagine. And this is a future that was imagined very recently. Uh, and in the same pace of picking up steam and creating our imaginations, you guys are all aware that we're, we're in a, a time and a place where conversational AI and virtual assistance is, is something that's present in our lives and being cultivated and worked on. Uh, and, you know, right now you might think that they're kind of silly, uh, but it is our imagination and we will get there. And one important question is, why now? Right? Why is conversational AI a thing now? Well, I would argue that when we think of intelligence, when we think of AI, we think of the fundamental sociological and anthropological meaning of intelligence with us before we even had fire. Right? When you think of intelligence, you think of your neighbor who has some special intelligence on how to build that, that tool, right? that fork or that, that spear. And then you go to them and you interact with naturally evolved means, conversation. Hey, you build the best spears. Like, how do you do that? I want to learn more, right? And, and that's something that we want to manifest so that we can do more. And we imagined it in the 60s. This is a scene from Star Trek. And we're realizing it today. Well, why is it happening now? Why is it going to happen now? Well, I'll make an argument. And it's, it's, it, it manifests itself in recent Turing Award winners. In just the last few years, if you think about three key pillars that's making it possible today, we have the three Turing Awards of recent that have won the, essentially the Nobel Prize for computer science. Uh, and that's Alan Turing uh, on this slide. Uh, and the first Turing Award winner I'm going to talk about is uh, Michael Stonebreaker, right? And he won the Turing Award for databases in 2014. We have this phenomenal capability of capturing data in the world and in, uh, uh, in our lives and storing it in computers. And he pioneered some of the key means that we store data. So data's one. Next, the Turing Award winner of 2017, the winners 
are John Hennessy and David Patterson, right? And they won the Turing Award for envisioning what compute would look like in our generation and the next, right? And that compute has gotten smaller and tinier. It's in our pocket, and it, it does phenomenal things. People are playing sophisticated 3D games on their cell phone for seven hours, right? The kinds of innovations that came from John and David allowed us to do more with compute, data and compute. And lastly, just recently, 2018, man, it seems like yesterday, but it's already 2020, uh, Jeffrey Hinton is one of the key winners of the innovations as it relates to models and models that are used to capture data and make them useful for inference, right? Machine learning. And so you put these three things together. You've got data, compute, and the models, the substrates that we can store intelligence, innovations in all those. And without any of the other pillars, we would not be able to do interesting AI, right? The, the, the models themselves require data to gain knowledge, because that's all they learn from, is from data. These kinds of machine learning, deep learning, recurrent neural networks, deep neural networks, and without the compute to train those models, to, to be able to do the processing, to embed that model that with the data, with the knowledge it needs from the data, we wouldn't be able to have it. So we needed all three pillars to come together at the same time, represented in the three recent Turing Award winners. Now, my work has been around what I believe to be one of the transformational technologies, conversational AI. It started with Lucida. Uh, in my lab. It was initially called Sirius, and then Apple wasn't happy, and we called it Lucida. Uh, and it was an open source creation, a virtual assistant technology that anyone in the world could use. And from those learnings, the next project was Clink. Uh, and Clink is a company that I started in 2015 with some bright colleagues and, and grad students. Uh, and we've grown it to great success, and we'll talk a little bit about that success. And next, I'm moving on to a new endeavor that you'll all learn about in the coming months, maybe a year. Uh, and it's quite exciting about the next uh, generation of technology. But let's understand why we're having that revolution today and what it looks like. Well, on this slide, you see on the left, that's actually the old way things were done. Natural language processing, the foundation of conversational AI from a pedagogical standpoint, has, has traditionally been based on uh, thank you, computational linguistics and linguists in general, based on ways that we represent language, right? Grammars, right? You can actually take a sentence and identify the nouns, verbs, and adjectives in that sentence, and then you can build these structures like parts of speech trees where you can see the noun phrase and the verb phrase, and you can reason about things. You can say, well, if this verb comes before that noun and the verb from the synonyms that I know about uh, I mean this, then I can infer that, right? The problem with this technique is you have to enumerate those rules. You have to enumerate the grammars, the templates as to what you can say to a system. And that's why we have so many silly systems today. You say something outside of that, and it breaks, because no one anticipated that rule. The beauty of a deep learning approach that's trained entirely in data, an approach that doesn't know the nouns, verbs, and adjectives, just like your four-year-old at home doesn't know what a noun is, but he can speak complex sentences to you and understand you, Neural networks have a capacity to learn messy things and to infer from noisy information. So when you take a sentence like this, uh, I dropped way too much cash at gobbledygook last night and smacky, on Smacky Wacky, and my darn flippity flop overdrawn is overdrawn. Now I can't afford bloobity bloop. You may not have anticipated that kind of utterance. And so if you have a system for which it must have a rule to match to that, if you have to have the synonyms and dictionaries that has gobbledygook in it, if, you, if you're required to have a particular grammatical structure, this might break a system. But a system trained with deep learning and only data by learning from the experiences of listening to how folks are talking in the world might be able to do better. Build systems that don't know what nouns are, and you may achieve the kind of AI that we use, the kind of intelligence that we use in our biological brains. So a sentence like this, you might ask someone, what's gobbledygook in this sentence? Anyone in this room would be able to say instantly that, you know, gobbledygook uh, must be a place you can spend money at. It must be a merchant, right? And if you say how many verbs came before that, you would have to really think and process that because it, that wasn't required in view understanding it. It turns out that 
It's the patterns in the experiences you've had in data that allows you to understand what that, that word is, even though you've never seen it before. And you may not have seen this particular combination of things before the word, but no matter what comes after it, you can infer, you know, that's probably a place you can spend money at, just given the patterns. And that's what we embed in these models, and this is, this is something that uses uh, a recurrent neural network that is uh, an LSTM, and you can actually have it read the sentence backwards and forwards using a bidirectional LSTM to use future contacts and previous contacts of the patterns, the sequence of things that, recognize, that resemble something you've seen before, to infer what that is. Train your systems with that. And actually, you can do that for anything in the sentence. Gobbledygook is a merchant uh, on Smacky Wacky. That's probably something you can spend money on. Uh, uh, and the flippity flop is overdrawn. Oh, well, given my knowledge, that might be a nickname for an account and you can't afford blue blue Well, blue de blue is probably expensive, more, you know, uh, maybe not, and it's also something you spend money on, right? So you can do a lot of inferences when you train systems inspired for a conversational AI, inspired by... Uh, can you show me some uh, details this. on and my here's account, a demo. please? Your account balance is $9,766.77 and you have $5,125.64 outstanding on your statement balance, which needs to be paid before Tuesday, October 8, 2019. The minimum amount you can pay the account is $50. Cool, let me make a payment for the minimum amount, please. Okay, I can pay the minimum amount for you. The minimum amount to be paid is $50. Is this correct? That's interesting. Yeah, sure. It gets interesting. Payment <laughs> successful. However, based on the amount you are paying, hmm. I recommend getting a payment plan. Would you like to get started? Yeah, sure. Please provide the transaction you would like a payment plan for. Uh, let's do it for that uh, Delta flight where I went to California to visit my brother. That was uh, that was pretty pricey. between the three available payment plans. Uh, let's do it for the 12-month one. Give me a little time. Okay, I have your 12-month payment plan at $104.64 month for your 1,235.56 transaction at Delta. Would you like to confirm this payment plan? Actually, I, I changed my mind. Can we do it for that hospital bill where I went and got stitches? That was extremely expensive. I should stop playing hockey. And also, can you uh, give me about 18 months to pay that bad boy off? Okay, I have your 18-month payment plan at $113.02 a month for your 1987 transaction at St. Joseph's Hospital. Would you right. like to confirm this payment plan? Yes, please. Yeah. So, so that is the level of human expectation that we would want conversational AI to understand. And so we can realize that there are other open problems. Uh, and, you know, um, there's multiple distinct problems that needs to be solved in tandem to create an experience like that, right? And, um, and just take a deep dive and have a look at uh, some of the work that's coming next. But, but how does this, what does this mean in our lives, right? So we expect this is what happened with Alexa and Google Assistant, Siri, and all that. Yeah, everyone's excited when it launches. And then, Nobody talks to it after a while. The engagement goes down. Everyone bought it, and now no one talks about it. Well, what we saw when we launched a system based on that kind of technology to 6 million users is month after month after month, engagement goes up. If you can trust these things to understand you, you will want to engage with it and get the value of convenience in your life and improving your capabilities live. Now, 4 million out of 6.5 million people are interacting with it regularly, and this is a native... Turkish in Turkey. It turns out that when you just train with data, it doesn't matter what language it's trained in. It's agnostic to language. It learns like a four-year-old. Uh, and what was even more impressive is people, the average user of those four million, use it more and more over time. It's creating value for their lives they're returning to. That's the goal, right? And what I would argue, and I think that what is required for real innovation is you want to aspire to something, not just be better than something, right? It turns out that I think Google, Amazon, and Apple are competing with each other, not interesting.
not interesting, right? Because you can go from something poopy to something a little less poopy, right? Uh, and that's not interesting. Aspire for human in the room level understanding. Challenge the work you do to be work where you can interact with it freely without having an instruction manual as to what you can say to it. That's how I've driven all of the work that I've done in this space, right? And that's why we were able to do something that's much closer to that ultimate goal. And I will continue this work, and I would say the next really important challenge is how can these systems learn with you? As you interact with it, how do you take some of that neural modeling inspired uh, insights and then create a system that as it talks to more people and it's gaining more knowledge in the world, how do you create that system? Uh, and so you will see very soon some work coming in that space. Thank you.